Welcome to today's episode of the Normalized Surrogacy Podcast by Surrogacy Mentor. I'm your host, Carrie Flamer Powell, experienced gestational surrogate, surrogacy agency founder, and owner of Surrogacy Mentor and Modern Parent Mentor, where our aim is a safe, ethical, and enjoyable surrogacy journey for all. Today, I am joined by our special guest, attorney Molly O'Brien. Welcome, Molly. Thank you so much for having me, Carrie. I'm happy to be here. Yes, I can't believe it's taken us this long to have a chat, but I'm really super happy to be talking with you. And today we are going to talk about lots of different things, Um, surrogacy in general, kind of what's going on in 2024 from your perspective. You're also the new SEEDS president this year, and so we want to talk a little about that and what SEEDS is doing this year. And then maybe we'll hear some of your interesting cases and what people need to be looking out for. So before we jump into all of that, I am going to read a little bit about you so that people know how awesome you are like I do. So Molly O'Brien has worked in the field of assisted reproduction since 2005. Previously, she worked for an egg donation agency and a surrogacy agency where she became familiar with all aspects of assisted reproduction. Since becoming an attorney in 2011, Molly has gained extensive experience in drafting and negotiating surrogacy, egg donation, and sperm and embryo donation contracts. Ms. O'Brien has also appeared before many local judges to help parents finalize their parental rights and has extensive experience in obtaining all documents necessary for her clients to return to their home country. Molly graduated magna cum laude from Whittier Law School and authored a Whittier Law Review titled, An Intersection of Ethics and the Law, the Frozen Embryo Dilemma, and the Chilling Choice Between Life and Death. Ms. O'Brien is the past chair of the Legal Professional Group section of ASRM. Additionally, Ms. Bryan is a member of the ABA's Art Executive Committee, the ABA Sponsorship Committee, the ABA CLE Committee, and she's also the co-chair of the ABA Legislative Committee. Having served on the SEEDS Legal Committee and the Conference Planning Committee for several years, she is very excited to work with SEEDS as the incoming president for 2023 through 2025. So basically, you have zero time to sleep is what I'm hearing. <laughs> Something and like no, that. Yeah, like like five minutes to eat lunch every day. So, wow, you're busy. Yeah, it's really busy. It's a really, well, as you know, this is the most amazing job in the world we get to do. So somehow it all falls into place and works out. It all works out. It all comes together. So, well, it's an impressive resume for sure. And you're well known in the industry as an awesome attorney for surrogates and intended parents. And tell us the name of your current law firm. So I am currently a partner at International Fertility Law Group, which is IFLG. Um, that is the uh, law firm that was founded by Rich Vaughn, my partner. Mm-hmm. And you guys are in Southern California, right? Correct. We have an office in Los Angeles and an office in New York City. Awesome. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. Right. Bicoastal. Awesome. Yep. Okay. Well, super excited to dig in here. So let's just jump in and start chatting about your specialty within the industry and what brought you to this field? Why did you become interested? I know you worked for an agency before, but what was it that made you think, you know what, this is where I'm going to focus my law career? It's, I think it's kind of a cool story, actually. So before I even knew about this field, I worked for a film production company. My undergrad degree is in film producing. And I worked for a wonderful producer here in Los Angeles. And her brother is a fertility lawyer. Uh, a pretty well-known one, Dean Masserman. And so we shared an office suite together. And as I was working for her, Dean, you know, I got to kind of know him and Andy Vorzimer, and I started working for their egg donation company, which is called Egg Donation Inc. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. I got a check one day from a client to deposit into their client trust account. And on the memo line of the check, it said, for our hopes and our dreams. And I said, you know what, oh. this is this is the career. It's really funny because what I learned, what I learned in film school was to budget and schedule movies. And now that's pretty much what I'm doing for people having families. I'm working on how to make this financially work. What's the schedule look like? And just guiding them through the whole thing. So it's the same skill set, 
It's almost like this mm-hmm. was the universe's plan from the beginning, you know, and just all the moons aligned. And that's when I started working at the egg donor agency. Mm-hmm. I switched over because they shared an office with Center for Surrogate Parenting, CSP, mm-hmm. and they needed somebody to fill in while one of their employees was on maternity leave. So I filled mm-hmm. in and ended up getting hired full time there and mm-hmm. loved it. And it was while I worked at CSP that the two owners of CSP, who were Karen Sinesu and Bill Handel at the time. Mm-hmm. Interesting, fun side note, Bill Handel wrote the first surrogacy contract in the state of California. Um, Yeah. So they said, you should go to law school. And I looked at them and I kind of laughed. I said, who goes to law school in their 30s and gets themselves into crippling debt for the rest of their lives? And they're like, you do. (laughs) But honestly, they really encouraged me. And they said, we will let you leave work early so you can go to school at night because I needed to have a job. I had a mortgage. I had, you know, I had life to manage. Um, And they supported me through the whole thing. And then when I graduated from law school, I left there and went and worked for Andy and Dean's law firm, Borzimer Masterman. And I was there for a handful of years. Then I opened my own law firm. And then, um, you know how it is in the industry, quality of life is really important. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our clients don't live in the same time zone as us. And so mm-hmm. Rich Vaughn and I had been talking for many years about the possibility of partnering and the, the moon's aligned and there we were. And so that's, and this is where we will be till um, retirement. We are very, very happy together. Oh, I love that. And I love that it all came together organically and over time. Mm-hmm. And that's how all of my business partnerships and deals have all come together as well, yep. organically. <laughs> so I love that. Yep. Awesome. And so do you focus um, on surrogates or parents or do you do all of the above? I do all of the above, but I will say about 90% of the cases that I personally handle are intended parents. That seems to be where um, I shine the best. I'm able to really serve clients well in the intended parent role. And having worked at a surrogacy agency, I really understand why certain protocols are in place and uh, the special relationship that they need to have with the surrogate. Um, So I like to get to give that kind of advice as well. Absolutely. I love that. Um, All right. So let's talk about seeds for a little bit. So for those that are listening that don't know what I'm talking about, SEEDS is um, the acronym for the Society for Ethics and Egg Donation and Surrogacy of which Molly and I have been members of for ever and a day. And Molly is the, as we mentioned, incoming new president. And tell us a little bit about what SEEDS does, what, why they exist, and what their importance is in the industry from your perspective. I love this topic. So SEEDS is the only organization of its kind where they were formed years and years ago by a group of agencies who came together and said, wow, we're the only ones in this field who aren't regulated. Mental health professionals are regulated. Doctors are regulated. Lawyers are regulated, but not the agencies. Something needs to be done about this so that agencies aren't taking advantage of surrogates or intended parents, so that agencies aren't stealing money this, you know, it was designed with such a good soul and a good heart at the core of it. Um, and after its formation, many, many years have passed. And now what's really cool about getting to be the president right now is that just last year, the organization um, set forth and voted on a series of standards that agencies that are members of SEEDS will have to be in compliance with in order to continue to be a member of SEEDS. Mm-hmm. And this is the only thing of its kind. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so beautiful and unique. And it's, you know, which just launching right now, the Mm -hmm. compliance period. So we're kind of feeling our way through it together as an industry. But I'm seeing so much enthusiasm about it. And I think this is something that a lot of agencies have really been looking forward to. Yeah, I think, um, like you mentioned, we've, for years as an industry been looking at the fact that, you know, unfortunately there's scary, you know, stories out there about agencies gone awry. And every time something like that happens, we as professionals think, oh, what can we do to prevent the next one from happening? And 
a piece of that is if there isn't, if we don't want a government agency stepping in and regulating us, then we need yeah. to regulate ourselves. And that's, I know, a huge piece of it for a lot mm -hmm. of us yeah. is we are going to set the standards for what we want to see in the industry as professionals. And we want people to know that we are holding ourselves accountable to a set of ethics and standards mm -hmm. that are important to us to keep the industry safe and equitable and ethical. And mm -hmm. I think it's important that the public understands that that's happening and happened and been happening for years. Mm -hmm. There's another aspect of this as well, which is how we are viewed outside of our bubble. I think the Pope's mm -hmm. recent statement condemning surrogacy is a clear example of how misunderstood this industry is. And mm -hmm. I think that um, the thing that should drive agencies to want to seek out seeds and to seek out a seed certification and to follow those standards is because everybody in these other countries, which is a huge client base for many people, they are looking to agencies that they know they can trust. They want some sort of seal of approval, so to speak, and nothing like that exists. And they hear the horror stories. A lot of times, people who aren't familiar with what we do only focus on the horror stories, right? And they hear about agencies stealing money from parents or not disclosing certain things and the horrible things that can happen. And so now parents in these other countries who don't know where to start, they now suddenly have a place to start. They have a place where if this agency has the seal of approval of seeds, you know that they are going to be following a through Z of these particular standards, and you have at least that level of protection. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Just like you mentioned, um, doctors have the medical board and right. the American Medical Association. And mm -hmm. when you go to look for a doctor or a specialist, you're like, what is their certification? Mm -hmm. Are they a member of this organization? What are their reviews with this organization? Mm -hmm. You're looking at all of those things, and this is a starting place and a really good one for agencies yeah. is, are they a member of SEEDS? Mm -hmm. And not just agencies, but lots of other professionals in the field, right? Mm -hmm. You know, insurance, escrow. Excellent point. Yeah, Attorneys, yep. all the things, right? Mm -hmm. It started with agencies, but we're now at how many members in SEEDS? Oh, we've got hundreds. Uh, if you include everybody that's outside of agencies. Right. Yeah, hundreds. And so we're talking about the industry as a whole mm -hmm. when we're talking about professionals that are held to these standards and ethics. And um, though it's rolling out initially with agencies, mm -hmm. we are still setting the precedence that those that come to this industry mm -hmm. need to know that we are ethical, we are striving for these standards in all things exactly. when it comes to protecting everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if you had to just say one thing, what would be your number one goal for your tenure at SEEDS as president? There are so many things I'm excited about attacking with it. Um, I don't know if I can say number like a, a, a one, but maybe I would say the successful implementation of the standards. Mm -hmm. I think that would probably be the biggest thing that I think we need to accomplish um, mm -hmm. and that I will be really happy when that's done. And I hope that that is completed by the end of this calendar year. Um, and that I'd love to see the membership grow because of the positivity that's coming from it. Um, a couple of other goals that I have, I'd love to mention because I'm excited about them is sure. I, I really like to start the educational process of other professionals in this industry getting some sort of seed certification as well. Because mm -hmm. even though I have a law degree and I have to follow certain ethical standards as a lawyer, there are certain things that are specific to what I do in the fertility world that are not going to be part of the normal ethics for mm -hmm. my lawyer life. So, for example, right. one of those things would be the best practice is that a egg donor and an intended parent have separate legal representation. Right. But that's not part of the legal standards in the world. But that would be something that I would love to see be applicable to fertility. And, right. you know, same with the gestational carrier and things like that. So I'd love to see that happen down the road, too. I think that's probably a little bit further away. Let's go ahead and get the agencies on on track and then worry about the others. But that would be a really great thing I think we could do. Yeah, I love that. I think um, it, 
regulation in general sometimes has a negative connotation. Yeah. But I think when we're talking about people's lives and literally their life savings and mm -hmm. their children, and in terms of surrogates, their bodies and their families, mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about literal life and death mm -hmm. and we can't make it safe enough, in my opinion. Right. And if that means self-regulation and setting these standards and adhering to them, I think it's the least that we can do as professionals to ensure that we're doing the the best by our clients mm -hmm. and patients. Yeah. So I think it's a good thing. I, I love agree. it. So you mentioned, um, you know, and I mentioned as well about nightmare cases and, you know, things mm -hmm. that can be scary, the negative stuff that does happen. So let, I think it's important not to scandalize or, you know, make it, you know, like tabloid stuff, but I think it's important to educate people on what can go wrong and how to avoid it or, you know, mm -hmm. steps that could have been taken that would have helped the situation. So can mm -hmm. you share any of that type of experience from your law experience? Yes, definitely. And a little from my agency experience. Yes, yes. So nightmare cases is is a interesting topic because we hear a lot of things and sometimes we get to experience a lot of things or our colleagues call us and say, I've got this situation and I would really love some assistance with it. Um, there's a pretty, I wouldn't say common nightmare thing, but there's a more common thing that I do see happen and it's relationship based. I think the single most important thing when going through a surrogacy journey is the parent's relationship with their surrogate. Mm -hmm. That needs to be on point and they need to be seeing eye to eye from day one. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of parents for a variety of reasons, maybe feel rushed to match with a particular surrogate mm -hmm. um, or pressure to match with a particular surrogate. And they maybe don't have the education or the experience to ask the right questions to see if it's a good fit. So right. a common not too terribly common, but a thing that I do see happen often is that parents will match with a surrogate through an agency or independently, and nobody has a conversation about some of the key issues, like termination of pregnancy would be a big one. And mm -hmm. I, I just had a match break last week over a termination of pregnancy issue. So the parents were matched with the surrogate, and they're at the contract phase. So if you're mm -hmm. already at the contract phase, you've matched, you've paid for the surrogate screening, you've paid for her psychological assessment, and you've paid the lawyers, you're already at contract. So you're well financially into this match. Yes. And we find out in the match that no termination of pregnancy discussion happened at the match meeting. And Ugh. that, in fact, the parents didn't see eye to eye with the surrogate on this. And Ugh. so... Everybody agreed that the right thing to do was not to continue together. But now these yeah. parents have lost three months and right. $10,000 and they are back to square one. And right. so I would consider that a, a, not a nightmare case, but a serious problem. And I think mm -hmm. that by mental health professionals being involved in the matching process, which by the way, is a seed standard, mm -hmm. I think that by um, education to intended parents about the questions they should be asking when matching with a surrogate can help eliminate these kinds of risks. Because to right. me, apart from medical tragedy, I think the biggest tragedy in the world is wasted time and money doing this because people who become surrogates and people who are intended parents, they have a special kind of heart, mm -hmm. you know, and the surrogates will fall in love with the intended parents and the parents will fall in love with them. And to find out four months later that you can't work together because of something that should have been discovered on day one is really heartbreaking for yes. a lot of reasons. Absolutely. Well, it is serious. It's important. And that's, it's a mismanagement on the agency's part. Um, in my opinion, as an agency yeah. founder, I think that the standards, like you mentioned, are going to be huge in helping educate Mm -hmm. agencies, particularly new ones that are coming in and mm -hmm. saying, these are the things you need to make sure you're doing. And I, cause I don't think it's intentional that things like that get left out. I think it's just naivete sometimes mm -hmm. of, you know, skipping things like that. Yeah. Um, when I had my agency, we called it the CTJ, the come to Jesus. <laughs> and we got to make sure all the hard questions are asked yep. right up front because it's going to save everyone a lot of heartache to be uncomfortable for a few minutes to talk about these things. Yeah. 
That's a hundred percent the right way to go. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that's sort of like a common difficult one. Is there one that would fall under the nightmare category that you think is helpful for people to learn from? Yes. And it kind of has the same base, the relationship between the parents and the surrogate. Mm -hmm. So this was another termination of pregnancy situation. Mm -hmm. The parties were initially on the same page and only implanting one embryo. But at the embryo transfer, the thawed embryo didn't look great. So the doctor says to the intended parents who were, I believe, on a video chat because they were international and didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. The doctor says, would you like me to possibly thaw another one and implant another one because this one doesn't look great? Um, and so the parents said, yes, we'll implant two. The surrogate agreed, mm-hmm. um, even though the contract had a limit of one. But the mm-hmm. surrogate agreed. And lo and behold, she got pregnant with the twin. Mm-hmm. And immediately the parents contacted the surrogate and said, as soon as they found out it was twins, and said, we, we can't afford twins. We weren't expecting this. Um, we want you to terminate one of the babies. Mm-hmm. And she said, but that's not how I feel. And that's not what the contract says I have to do. I'm not terminating a healthy baby. Right. And then we get down the road about maybe a month and a half, two months later, and they do some of the basic prenatal diagnostic tests. And sure enough, something comes back and one of the babies now has a prenatal diagnostic issue. Mm -hmm. It's not confirmed. It's suspected. So now the parents mm-hmm. ask her to terminate again. And by the way, they have zero relationship at this point because she's right. angry from the time that they've asked her to terminate the pregnancy. Right. And the way that the contract was written, I represented the surrogate in this case. The way that the contract was written, the surrogate was not required to terminate under these circumstances because it was not a confirmed issue that was one of the ones specifically listed out. Right. So she ended up carrying the pregnancy full term and delivering, and it was a terrible journey for everybody. And a terrible yeah. situation. Um, sure. So I would consider that to be, it's probably the worst case I've ever had. There was just a lot of hurt feelings, a lot of anger, and a lot of unnecessary um, drama, you know, that yeah. could have been avoided by better communication, um, perhaps a better drafted contract, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. more mm-hmm. psychological support on all sides. And I feel like, one of the biggest risks people take is making rush decisions at the time of the embryo transfer when something like that happens. And I don't think the doctor's to blame here, but I do think that pausing and confirming with the agency and asking the agency, hey, do you want to get a mental health professional involved here? Because she's about to agree to something that's outside of the terms of the contract. Do we need to talk about this deeper? What can we do here? I think that might have made it a better situation. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. That's yeah. I think the, the last minute decisions is such a key piece of this because mm-hmm. that happened to me at my transfer as well. They asked Seriously. if I would increase the number of embryos and it wasn't a small number to increase to. It was a mm-hmm. number you would never hear of at all. I keep in mind, I transferred 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. 12 years ago was a very different world. Yes. So um, the number that I was asked to transfer was a number you would never hear today. But I think that um, those last minute decisions, everyone feels the weight of the world on their shoulders to make the right decision. Mm-hmm. And time is of the essence. And it's so scary to know what the outcome could be at that moment. Mm-hmm. But yes, I agree. So with what did you say? I... <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes. And I did it. And I keep in mind, I was independent. I didn't have an agency. I was figuring mm-hmm. it all out as I went along. Um, yeah. Got pregnant with twins and only one ended up making it to birth. Mm-hmm. So um, it ended up fine, but it could have ended up really horribly. So I think that I got lucky in a lot of ways, yeah. honestly. Yeah. And do you, because knowing you, how I know you today, you are a very smart, very smart, very strong and thoughtful speaker and thinker. Do you feel like you were that same person then? Did you advocate for yourself? I think that I, you know, that's such a good point. And I think a lot of women listening, especially those that that have been surrogates can relate to this. It's almost like 
you could be super strong and smart and like the best thinker and doer and planner. But then when you have the emotions of a surrogacy journey on top of you and you have this relationship with the parents and all you want is for them to become parents, it like it clouds your judgment a little bit in those moments. And Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if I was putting on my normal hat, I would not have made this the decision I did back then. So I think that we can't underestimate the pressure that surrogates feel Mm -hmm. in that moment to make this dream happen. And I think that that's where, like you said, a lot of the mistakes happen when on either side, when either party changes their baseline for what their Mm -hmm. compass is, right? For what they feel in their gut is the right thing to do Mm -hmm. it shifts a little bit and that's different from being flexible and being reasonable Mm -hmm. right but I think when you shift that core of who you know yourself to be and what you know Mm -hmm. is right for you when you feel that shift that should be a red flag on either side and from a legal perspective that situation is technically duress yes you know it it somebody is being forced to make a decision without proper informed consent or the ability to get that informed consent because that decision needs to be made now. Right. And and that's terrifying. And I think there's so many surrogates out there who don't know how to advocate for themselves Mm -hmm. and we need to stand around them and circle and hold our hands and say, it's okay to say, Mm -hmm. stop. I need a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's such good advice. And I think that surrogates today in 2024 are much more educated, yes. much more informed, and parents too, mm-hmm. much more informed, educated about the process and what their rights are and what their choices are. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think it's a really good thing. And I think part of what you're doing as the president of Seeds and part of what people that are, you know, members of Seeds that are advocating for and adhering to the standards. I think that's our ultimate goal is that we have better informed, educated, and then better outcomes, right? For the whole Mm -hmm. journey. That's Mm -hmm. what their ultimate goal is, is healthy, happy people at the end of this, whether that's a baby, the the baby's happy and healthy, the surrogate's happy, (laughs) parents are happy and healthy, the agencies are good. Like we want everyone to feel like, Mm -hmm. oh, we did it and we came out better for it. Yeah. So that's good. Well, th- I appreciate you sharing that story. I know it's sometimes the, um, the nightmare cases are a little draining, you know, touchy yeah. to talk about, but they're important. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of my questions I ask most everyone, particularly, um, professionals is what do you wish more people knew about surrogacy? Oh, this one's easy for me. I wish that more people knew that 99.9% of our cases are amazing and beautiful. Yes. <laughs> because like I mentioned at the beginning, I feel like people who don't really know who aren't in this field with us, they just think, oh, she's giving up a baby. Mm-hmm. No, she's not, not her child. She's not giving a baby up. They think that it's just all about the money. They think that, you know, there's all this weird coercion and even some people think human trafficking. It's there's all these misconceptions about what we do. And I don't think that the media does anything to help us, which is why I'm so glad about a podcast like this one. Um, We want to normalize these things and let people know that. I mean, was that your experience too, Carrie? Like were most of your cases just amazing and beautiful? Yeah, the occasional thing that would happen. But absolutely. Absolutely. And and I see these parents develop these relationships with the surrogates where maybe the surrogates carrying another child for them in the future, or sometimes even two children. And they're part of each other's families in such a beautiful and respectful way that that's what surrogacy is. And that's what I wish people could see more is all the happy stuff. Absolutely agree with you. Like you mentioned, we as professionals and you know, you used to work at an agency. I used to own an agency. I was a surrogate. Like we are in a bubble, right? Mm -hmm. We are in a bubble of, we know, like we know the beauty and the, the, the wonderfulness that happens every single day, right before our eyes, but people only on the outside, so to speak, only get to see what is shown to them. And sadly, because of our media culture, it's typically Mm -hmm. sensationalized or it's through the eyes of a celebrity and people are just now, I feel, starting to get real stories mm-hmm. that are coming out um, that 
really show like the truth behind what a surrogacy journey, why someone would be a surrogate, why does someone need to go through surrogacy to build their family? Like what are the the matters of the heart that come into play? Mm-hmm. I think that's finally starting to come out. Um, and I, I think that people should reject the sensationalized versions that are showing up in their newsfeed and ask deeper questions. Mm-hmm. And I think that, um, you know, reaching out to members of Seeds and asking those questions to them is a good place to start for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I appreciate people that are doing work like you to help educate as well. So thank you for that. Well, I appreciate you. Thank you. Well, it's been awesome to finally catch up with you and have this chat. I know that we've been in each other's circles and orbits for many years in the industry, and I'm just glad that we're now able to work on the officers Mm -hmm. team together at Seeds and work on some goals together in that way and also just be able to help each other go through the process of being a professional in 2024 in this industry because it's changing rapidly. And yes. I think um, the more education and resources that we all have, the better. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. Thank you so much, Molly. Appreciate you. And that brings us to the end of this episode of the Normalized Surrogacy Podcast. Again, I want to thank my very special guest, Molly O'Brien, for joining me today. Be sure to check us out online at surrogacymentor.com. If you're interested in knowing whether surrogacy is right for you, take our easy two-minute quiz on our website. Also check out modernparentmentor.com if you are considering an independent surrogacy journey as a surrogate or intended parent. Subscribe to this podcast to learn more about gestational surrogacy and how to have a safe, ethical, and enjoyable surrogacy journey. Talk to you next time.